Today on the Grave Talks, Order of Exorcism, Part 2, as we continue our conversation with Timothy Earle. Timothy Earle is an employee of the Advent International Order of Exorcists, reports directly to Archbishop James Cloud, Chief Exorcist. His adventure began back in 1997 when he began collecting EVPs with no ill intent. Nevertheless, things moved fast into a very different direction after his wife was subjected to a demonic assault. His life has been profiled in a number of documentaries and television series since. Today, we learn what it takes to be an exorcist and what his life is like going down that path on the Grave Talks. You know, there's a lot of depression associated with uh, Sure. Uh, so- You'd almost have to be in that state, I would think, to, uh, you know, you could be that worn down, which which so many of us get that way, just with life, that it, it, I would assume that uh, someone who is already uh, suffering from depression, from in, in, in mental illness as well, are those people bigger targets for something to come in and, and possess someone? Does someone have to ask? Does someone have to do something to to invite something like this in to attach to themselves? Or does it just kind of sneak in when you you least expect it? Uh, it can sneak in when you least expect it. There's a, I had a case where I, um, you know, a good Protestant family, um, in a city far away, not too far away from me, um, Go to active in the church. Goes to the church. Um, husband was a youth minister. I mean, he, he, you know, the the, the very stereotypical um, Bible Belt family. Sure. And they were also prominent. Um, he he was a president at the lo- local bank. Um, she um, was a socialite. You know, I think if they probably married into money or you know had money the old fashioned way, but I'm not certain. Anyway. Um, they they started having um what um ended up being demonic activity in their home and they were being attacked um we never got to the the root of why um, sometimes you just don't get a why mm-hmm. uh, and you just have to you know be ready to live with that but the the thing that she shared with me after it was all said and done you know she sent me a letter she said that the realization that this was even real immediately outcast her from the rest of society. That is, she could remember, she shared that she was sitting in a busy traffic intersection at a red light, and she's looking around, and she is not part of what's happening right there at that moment, because now she has a knowledge of what everybody has dismissed, you know, and this knowledge of this life, this spiritual life and the dangers thereof um, just separates her from even being, being able to socialize. Mm-hmm. So her into uh, PTSD, she had to um, you know, go to professional counseling. And my understanding is she's still doing it today because, you know, her whole belief system's upended. Yeah. So um, it's, 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 a, it's a life shocker. Uh, and uh, I remember that I'll show this one story with you real quick. You know, people reach out to me all the time. Hey, I want to get involved or, hey, can you take me ghost hunting? Um, I even took a, a TV show ghost hunting a couple of times, actually. Um, but uh, there's a uh, one one yeah, social worker reached out and uh, one of her children, I actually think it was a young adult, but with Down syndrome, was really into ghost hunting, wanted to go ghost hunting, was asking me to take them ghost hunting and i just simply responded okay great what happens if we actually see a ghost how's how's your uh young man gonna react yeah and she spice back never mind <laughs> so you know you got to think yeah. it through everybody wants to see a ghost until they actually see a ghost and it, they have that experience it's not like riding splash mountain it's uh it's a serious thing <laughs> where where there, there could be uh real uh effects real uh, outcomes to doing it yeah, there is, and especially for somebody doing what I do. We get attacked all the time. Um, when I have uh, something coming, a case coming, even before I know it, we'll, we'll start having paranormal activity. I walk into the living room, the chandelier swinging, you know. Um, we, we start seeing shadow people. Um, we've, and I'll know that I'll be getting a phone call shortly. Um, so 
those and, and those are actually topical. Um, mm-hmm. I those type of act that type of activity is really easy to for me to interact with because you know they're not really affecting me. They're just I'm, I'm been there, done that. You know, is uh, that is it trying to taunt you when it's doing things like that? Like, yeah, you think you're going to go help? Look what we're already here. We're already doing this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of it is feeling me out, seeing what I am, what I'm capable of. Mm-hmm. Um, trying to, some of it's trying to scare me off before um, sure. I can do it. But uh, um, it's hasn't worked in the past, and maybe it should have at times. <laughs> I'll be honest <laughs> with you. There's been a couple of cases that I shouldn't have gone on. But, yeah. So let me ask you this: You, you had brought up uh, earlier that. Uh, you work with some psychologists and especially when you're trying to evaluate, is this person uh, mentally ill or is there a possession going on? How on board are some of those psychologists where they do the evaluation and they say, yeah, we don't think this person has any sort of disorder going on. Do you have ones that are like, I think possession is the answer here, considering they're coming from a world of medicine and, and that sort of, you know, viewpoint of science that these things are, you know, well, it's some sort of malady with the, the the brain. So I won't get they're possessed. They, no licensed doctor would ever do that. They they would be, you know, right out of town. Sure. Uh, so I'm not going to get a possessed. Now, I've personally known some of them. I know that some of them do believe in possession. Mm-hmm. But what I will get is they're not mentally insane. So they'll tell me that there is there is a psychosis here. There is something medical here. No, this is something emotional um, that, uh, you know, uh, counseling can handle, um, you know, or move them on to meds. Or I get the, uh, no, they're they're completely lucid. Um, we don't believe that they're suffering. Even if they're having um, um, paranormal um, activities, um, and even if they think that they're being punched and attacked and, and things of that nature, a tr- actual psychiatrist or psychologist will be able to say, well, it's not because of an illness. We can, so once I get that, that's all I get. And I'll run with that, you know. Sure. That must be interesting to hear from a psychologist, though, of, you know, that they are on board, not necessarily in terms of a diagnosis, but just in conversation of, yeah, I believe that sometimes there is possession going on well there's a lot of actual um study that has taken place recently in cold west spirit spirit therapy mm-hmm. so and more along the lines of uh nps uh, uh, multiple personality um, disorder yeah. yeah right so um even if they don't have actual um possession if you treat each individual as a um, spirit, so to speak, and putting that spirit to ease and treat that spirit, people end up living much more happier and productive lives. So yeah. um, now having said that, is that a belief? No, possibly not necessarily, but it is opening uh, more of the uh, academia's eyes. And you know, um, there's a uh, Dennis Schrader, Dr. Dennis Schrader, is a um i i i'm sorry i'm drawing a blank i don't know what he's the doctor of however mm-hmm. he has been doing studies uh, more along the lines of uh, psychokinesis uh e- esp things of that nature but uh, you know it all bleeds together and uh, one of the things that he said in a seminar i went to watch was um the 0.03 percent of all of academia has ever been applied to studying the supernatural sure I mean, it just doesn't exist. So if you look at it, I mean, you know, we, we've mathematical equations created, you know, told us there's the, the God particle, right? And they build a, uh, you know, billion dollar collider over there in Europe. Yeah. Just on mathematical equations. Yet people are having these experiences. We're not studying them. How, how often do you think it is that people are, and I'm not saying, um, you know, they're, they're having a major, uh, uh, need for an an exorcism or or they're in a very low state of it but they are simply being said told you know you have this disorder take this medicine and your brain will kind of calm down a little bit and yes it it, it may help with it but how basically how often are people possessed or or have some sort of attachment to them 
and they're just being treated as if this is just a mental illness. But there's no real statistic on that. No, no. I don't. It's all conjecture, right? Yeah, exactly. I'm just wondering what your opinion is on that. Uh, my opinion is, I, I would say that maybe as high as 20%. Wow. Um, there's, I mean, I, there's a um, archbishop um, from um, Georgia that uh, thinks it's more like 90%, right? Mm-hmm. But um, there's another um, archbishop that thinks it's not nah, maybe 2 3%. Sure. It's, it's all opinion. We don't have eyes or ears into that world. You know, they're not our cases or their studies. But yeah, it's it happens. We know that it happens. And uh, unfortunately, there's really not a lot that we're going to be able to do about it. So even in in even if they're diagnosed um, with a um, disorder and they are directed to take medications. And we still think there are cases where we still think that um, they are actually dealing with possession. You know, a priest can proceed forward with with diligence. I mean, with I mean, you know, being very careful um, with exorcism. But that patient must continue taking the meds. The priest cannot, will not tell the the client to stop um, their medical treatment. So. Does that, and I, in no way am I ever suggesting someone stop taking their meds. I am very pro take your meds. Yeah. But but does does someone who is medicated does that make it easier or more difficult for your in your opinion uh, to treat someone spiritually uh, for uh, a possession? Uh, d- does the the medicine help keep things away, keep things down? Obviously, it, it should help to have them live a better life. But does it make it more difficult to exercise something out of them or does it have any effect at all? So I've read two cases and I have two conversations on this and it goes both ways. There's one conversation that is the, the patient is more malleable, right? Mm-hmm. They're more susceptible to influence. Um, there's the other conversation that is there may be subs- um, open to influence. However, that influence doesn't stick. So, um, and in the two cases that I read, um, both being medicated, um, that was the different conclusions of the different priests. So, um, and then the, the, the two priests I spoke to about it, um, had, you know, each their own opinion too. I've personally never interacted with it. I haven't, um, you know, I've identified somebody who I think needed to be on meds. I got the concurrence. They went on meds and they were not um, treated for exorcism or demonic oppression. Okay. Not so, but yeah, it's a, it's a fine line. Sure. It's it's a legal line. Yeah. It's a terrifying line. Yeah. And I mean, even beyond that, I mean, it's someone's life, obviously, and you had to tread very carefully as to where you go down and, and how that's that's handled. Let me ask you this, because there, there's a lot of, obviously, ghost hunting is is, is common today as finding a McDonald's, it seems. Um, and uh, there, there's tons of people out there doing it. Tons of people out there uh, just, you know, some with very careful and cautious ways of doing it. Some just, hey, I got this piece of equipment. Let's go see what it does. Uh, and, and willy-nilly trying to talk to the dead. Uh, is there, uh, or how dangerous I should say, is is ghost hunting with with various types of equipment, w- all the way from uh, a, a Ouija board, uh, all the way up to you know collecting EVPs, ghost boxes, insert device here that somehow yeah. seems to get you communication with the other side. Are all of those types of devices and tactics created equal, and you have? Just the same risk associated with using using a Ouija board versus a, a ghost box or something, or are there different levels of danger depending on what one is doing? Well, it's as far as the devices themselves, um, it's how you use the device. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go with your analogy that uh, they're all created equal. Okay, but um, it's it's your when you're ghost hunting, you're opening up yourself to interacting with whatever's on the other side, mm-hmm. uh, and you don't know what that. Uh, that thing is going to be and the very there's the and the more powerful the entities are negative entities so there's a very good chance that you're interacting with something that is negative 
That's not to say that you don't interact with human spirits and ghost hunting can be fun. Um, I, I used to enjoy it a lot, but, um, and there's fun ways to, to do it. And, mm-hmm. you know, um, you know, the, in biblical tense is called necromancy. You're not supposed to interact with the spirits, but if you read through it, you're not supposed to ask them for favors or get intel from them. You're actually supposed to challenge spirits. Um, you, in, in there's passage to that, but so as far as a moral aspect of it, I don't, I don't think that it's necessarily moral. It's fun. People do it to people, especially around Halloween. Everybody wants to go out and have a good scare, but they need to be able to learn. They need to know the dangers. And one of the dangers is, is you're going to bring something home. That's the first thing that typically happens. Mm-hmm. I mean, yes, you can have, see a ghost. Yes. You can hear get EVPs. Yes. You can get touched or pushed or see things pushed over and things. You know, that's, that's the fright. That's what everybody's looking for, but you can, the first real danger is bringing something home. That's more common than, than, than not, but things to the spirits will typically stick around no more than two, three weeks. And then they leave. Um, the next danger is yes, you're opening yourself up, giving something permission to interact with you, but also how much permission you give that is paramount to how much interaction you're going to receive. So if, if you're saying, spirit, come interact with me however you want, well, that spirit could jump you. Um, so, yeah, partial possession, temporary possession is a real danger. Um, then, of course, if the spirit doesn't like where they're at, they can attach themselves to you. And now you've got something hanging on you for an extended period of time. So it's all in the permissions that you give. And that's, you know, that's the spirit board, you know, um, that the Ouija board everybody's terrified of because you're giving something permission, tacit permissions, but you're also wanting to move that penchant, right? That little heart shaped thing. And you're giving the spirit permission to work through you. So now you're giving the spirit permission to jump you. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, and then, of course, a lot of people don't shut it down or no shut no to shut it down, let alone how to. When you're talking to something and want them to talk into a recorder, it's much less likely you're going to be uh, physically attacked um, or jumped because you're not given that permission. But people still do in the ways that they talk. Okay. So that's it's, it's how you approach it, I suppose. Obviously, the the level as to which you've gotten into this is very deep and and very powerful and meaningful to a lot of people. Uh, and, and you were you were brought there. You were driven there in in a very personal way in 1997. Can you explain a little bit more about what happened with with your wife and you and and that demonic attack that took place in your world? So, yeah, and and. I'm going to drag this out a little bit because I'm going to share a case with, with you. Okay? Sure. The, uh, we were wanting a large family. Um, uh, you know, I'm in love. I said, okay, whatever. Sure. <laughs> and, What's uh, 20 kids? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, she had a, she had a good target of seven. <laughs> um, we had two uh, son and daughter, um, you know, and we were trying to have more while she continued to have miscarriages. Sure. During that time, um, she also started seeing an entity. Now, most would call this the hat man. It is a shadow person that is a person that's blacker than black. You can't see any features, and they are not a shadow on the wall. They're like a 3D shadow standing in front of you. And this person, Chris, um, described as having a you know cape and a top hat, a um, shorter top hat, not quite a fedora. And it would walk across the room. It would stand in the closet and stare at her. Um, and it seemed to happen. And every time that happened, she seemed to have a miscarriage. Okay. So, um, and yes, we ended up uh, performing. Um, she, she was not possessed, but we believed that she was being attacked. And we performed a uh, simple exorcism on the home. Multiple, actually. And uh, ended up stopping it. Unfortunately, she did have lasting health um, conditions and we um, didn't have any more than the two children. Sure. Thank God we only have two children, but um, that's just me talking. <laughs> Obviously I'm I'm upset, right? Yeah. Um, something attacked my wife. Yeah. The, my life. And uh, so I actually started looking into this and yes, I came across the uh, legend of the hat man, but this is not the hat man. This is not. 
I've actually ran into this um, demon a few times, um, and it seems to go up and down the uh, I-35 corridor. And I know that sounds strange, but there is the uh, transaction of demons um, jumping by infection, and it, it can happen. So the um, whatever means it's traveling, is it actually goes up and down the, the corridor. So I've had cases um, down into Oklahoma, Texas, up into, into uh, Kansas City, Nebraska, Missouri, up in that area. Mm -hmm. And each of these cases with this particular demon, the woman is pregnant and ends up having a miscarriage. So we, you know, um, I don't think it's biologic, but um, I have... And I, I'll get there. I do have the name of it, but it's really strange. So fast forward, um, this one particular case is actually in, in Oklahoma. Uh, I'm not going to say where to protect the innocent. Sure. Um, she sent me a picture, and, and there's it's a picture of this uh, shadow entity, full full on standing there. Mm -hmm. So um, I go down, and you know, I start the investigative process. And there's multiple interviews, um, and it's a two and a half, three hour drive one direction. And I'm going down sometimes twice a week and to talk to this family. And um, one of the first things that they noticed is that every time I walked into the house, the clock stopped. All the clocks hanging on the wall stopped. And you know, you know they check batteries. They actually replaced the clocks, and, and time had even passed um, quite a few visits before they told me about this it was quite the thing so i started documenting it yeah a specific time and didn't matter what type of clock um, um could be digital it could be um analog could be there's even a wound clock um mechanical and it would stop they would all stop when i came in um, during the interview process um multiple EVPs were recorded. One of them, you know, I mentioned Psalms 93 and, and then the guttural tone, I get get a response saying, yeah, try that. Um, but this family is really unique. So they live in a, um, a residential area that's rural. And this is an area where five acre lots were um, set out for um, single home use. And you know there are double wides and single wides on these on these properties. The um, gal moved in and had her home built and uh, moved in, and then she's walking down the street and she sees her sister walking down the other way. Where her sister just moved in two months before, and they're actually kind of close, but they never told each other, so they have both moved in. And then there, another sister, which they don't interact with very much, um, moves in further down the street. And, and the way that their pattern is, their homes are actually in a triangle, which is kind of unique. And then they actually have a brother who is, and I, if I recall correctly, he's actually from a, a different father, so they didn't really know him well. He was actually in the same location before any of them were um, further on down, you know, the block. And um, so all four of them coalesced without talking to each other to purchase properties, um, build homes or have homes transferred there and to live out their lives. Um, so I got really curious about that. And one of the things that um, we find often with demonic activity is there's there's a lot um, tethers they, you know there seems to be a spider web of events and a lot of exorcists will call it layers there's a lot of layers to it and that you really want to go through the investigation and find all these layers it's to get as much intel as possible so i started investigating the property and come to find out it you know this area was indian land um mm -hmm. most of oklahoma is yeah but in the early um, 20th century, um, a conspicuous landowner, the gentleman who had uh, at one time owned more land than anybody else in the continental US, um, he actually took possession of this land, which was only supposed to be passed down through traditional native bloodlines. 
but the he convinced this young native that he'll be wealthy if he kills his father takes possession of the land and then sells it to him and they carry this out um and it's not discovered for from a few decades but so for a few decades he actually lived on the very spot where these four are now living come to find out it's their great great grandfather so he his farm and he even had a railhead it was such a big ranch he even had a railhead that came up um, you can see um, traces of this old rail bed still there. He ends up getting killed by his own train, uh, stepped out in front of it, tripped, the train ran over and killed him. Wow. After he died, it was discovered what had happened. And he had already been losing his, his it was a um, deck of cards. Uh, he had a uh, not deck of cards, house of cards, house of mirrors. He, he kept leveraging loans upon loans to buy land. So he he would get a loan to buy this land, and then get another loan to buy you know, against that to buy another set of property. So well, as soon as the strip money you know started struggling, um, he ended up losing almost everything. And this was the last piece of property he owned. When he died, the um, murder um, conspiracy was discovered. And the son ended, uh, ended up going to prison, and he was so upset he ended up um, cursing that property. He and um, not just him; there were some others involved. And I, I don't want to drag down any any native tribe. I'm not going to name a tribe. Sure, but um, they did absolutely perform a curse. Now, additionally, um, come to find out this. Um, client, the woman who's been affected, is suffering from multiple sclerosis. And she's actually seeking, um, she's getting a treatment that's an alternative treatment. I mean, she's getting traditional treatment plus an alternative treatment from a, a doctor um, who is tricking her body into thinking she's it's, her body's pregnant. The hormones apparently that are generated during a pregnancy is good um, to manage multiple sclerosis. Okay. That's the easiest way I can explain it. And I got, sure. I couldn't explain any, any further. Sure. The doctor ended up during the, the duration of my investigation, the doctor ends up committing suicide by jumping off the, the skyscraper downtown. He was being investigated as a crack, so there's this extenuating circumstances, but um, her treatments ended up um, stopping, right? Yeah. So um, I'm needing, I'm, I know, I'm convinced that there's absolutely um, demonic activity here. I do think that it was a curse that was um, opened up the opportunity for the, the demon to come. I do think that it's this demon that um, affected my wife that um, got me into this to begin with. And um, I'm gearing up to, and I think that it's more powerful than what I'm going to be able to deal with. I do think that there's a pulse possession. One of the things that um, this client describes in the presence of this demon is her body and bones shake as if you're in the at a concert where they're doing um, a bass drum sure. is, is being kicked you know, yep. or, you know, bass guitar at the lowest string. This, yeah. The vibrations just go through her ultra low frequencies to just vibrate her. She can, she can almost hear it, but it's, it's a feeling when I'm setting up to con conduct what, you know, I call a discernment. Um, she's talking to one of my uh, investigators and they're both older ladies and um, they're just, I, I jokingly call it hand pecking, but you know, they're, they're just talking. Um, and then you hear um, in a soft woman's voice, a, a third voice come over the top. And there's only three of us in the room. A third voice comes in over the top, says, Erigus Demonis. So what that is, is Latin for bear demons. Okay. And then. Following that, and I, I can actually send you this soundbite. Following that is a very low rumble. 
and it's just a sound. So um, that's the demon introducing itself to me. And, you know, of course, I didn't hear it at the time. I, I heard it at a later time. There was something else that happened. I, I forget what it was that made me go back and listen to that audio. Yeah, I, I have audio running at all times. Sure. Um, we did get, catch uh, additional pictures. Um, we, we did catch um, a, a, what I believe is a different shadow entity moving across the room. Um, during that night, actually, they owned, uh, one of the sisters owned a... Uh, a uh, uh, trailer home that um, they rented. Um, the elderly couple both died there, and we actually stayed in that mobile home. It was empty at the time, and that thing was so full of paranormal activity. I was uh, when, when we had gone through our, um, you know, our uh, discernment and went to bed. I was laying there in my on my air mattress. Something was poking me on the forehead all night, kept waking me up. Um, I went ahead and rolled cameras there because they said that they thought it might be camp um, haunted and doors are opening and closing, cabinet doors opening and closing. Um, you hear disembodied voices, you know, one of them helped me, the, you know, stereotypical. So uh, I ended up performing a uh, simple exorcism on that place as well as uh, funeral rites to try to help move people along. Now at this time, um, I conclude and I have my evidence, I am reaching back through and I'm, I'm working for the um, Second Order of St. Michael um, Order of Exorcist with Archbishop uh, File as the Chief Exorcist out in uh, Bria, California. Um, I reach out to him with the evidence and he's, he's in agreement that uh, a full exorcism needs to take place. So we start talking to a young um, bishop out of Atlanta, Georgia. At the same time, I get contacted by the History Channel who wants to um, come follow me. Uh, they had a TV show um, that was um, being piloted, and it was, um, but I guess I, I can share it. It's um, Jimmy Church, I'm sure you've heard of him, um, was the talent of the uh, TV show. And they wanted to call it The Unexplained. Ended up calling it Breaking Mysterious. It did air on the History Channel um, all over. Um, had a really neat time. But the thing of it is, is the, the whole premise of the story was things that you wouldn't normally know. The, no, people know about the priests and the bishops who perform exorcists, but they don't know the people who do the back work. So they wanted to come follow me. And they wanted to coalesce on an exorcism. And we were going to use this case for that TV show. Mm -hmm. Well, um, the person said, okay, but then they started getting full cold feet. The client got cold feet. And this is typical. You know, oftentimes leading up to an exorcism, the client will get cold feet. Yeah. Um, so there was a lot. Anytime you're dealing with the, a church, there's a lot of politics. And it doesn't matter, matter what, um, <laughs> what religion. It, it, it doesn't. Uh, there's always politics. Sure. So it got to a point where I just told the TV show, you know, go go do Atlanta. You know, they got people down there you can do the show on. They said, no, they wanted to do it with me. Um, so they came to Wichita, Kansas and followed me around for a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. That bishop was so pissed off. He wrote me a seven-page slam letter, handwritten and front and back. And just slamming me. So um, I reached out to the Archbishop. Archbishop didn't want to have anything to do with it. So I ended up, that's how I ended up going, finding Archbishop File. Uh, I'm sorry, Archbishop Cloud. Long story short, uh -huh. I ended up performing the exorcism myself down there on that place. And it was dry, absolutely dry. There was no activity, there was no emotions, there was nothing happening. And to this day, that house has not had any type of supernatural activity. So what happened? Well, I'm convinced that because she was no longer receiving that treatment, tricking her body to think that it was pregnant, that that demon just moved on, that it's gone. There's nothing there for it to take. There's, there's no life force for it to take. Sure. So um, that was probably, um, you know, back to all the strings that connect everything. Now I have other 
you know, I, I had a case that was connected to Zach Baggins. I don't, he doesn't know it. I, I'm not talking to him about it by yeah. any means. But, you know, there's there's always these little lines, these little tethers of how things can be put together. And uh, that case was just, you know, for it to go back to literally started in 1890 when um, the first um, possession of that property was needed. Mm -hmm. it, it was really, really interesting to, to go through that. Let me ask you this a little bit off of that subject, but when, when we're dealing with people here and we were talking earlier about mental illness and we talk about uh, people in prison, when we talk about people who've done horrible, horrible things, take BTK, for example, uh, someone like him who had clearly done so many things over and over with intent, was very blatant about it in court when he finally was caught uh is someone like that is that a mental illness is that an evil person is there is that all just within the realms though of them just being a shitty blob of flesh and being a bad human being or or is does it take something demonic and something dark to allow someone uh, the living person to do such horrific uh, acts on others well i think it's both um first and foremost you know you're living in the principality, as I mentioned. You're going to have demonic influence around you at all times. Yeah, and I mean, to some level, you know, temptations, right? However, um, that level of influence can absolutely change your psyche. You know, we most most uh, psychiatrists, so, sociology, you, you have a socialization process which can develop as well. Mm -hmm. So the world around you can develop that um, behaviors. Now, you brought up Dennis Schrader. Dennis yep. Schrader is the BTK, yep. and he's actually local, right? I know. So, I, I lived in Wichita for 10 years. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> and, my, right. and, my, right. and my co-host on, on the other show, Real Ghost Stories Online, still lives there. We both actually were on KFDI for about 10 years. <laughs> actually, she was on it for about 20. But You actually sound extremely familiar. <laughs> I was uh, I was on there for 10 years. Carol Hughes co-hosted another show with me. She was on there for Carol. about 20. Yep, yep. I, I know who she is. Yep. Let me that. <laughs> I actually... Yeah, I actually ghost hunted um, your studio. Oh, uh, it's uh, a Halloween uh, special on uh, Old Lawrence Road. Yeah, Old Lawrence Road. Yep. That's right. I, mean, I also did iHearts, and yeah, you know, I'm their local creepy guy. There was weird stuff in that. I'll, we can talk about that later. But yeah, there, I I worked in there for ten years, and we have plenty of weird experiences in that place. So the uh, but yeah, so Dennis Rader is actually um, in an interview stated that when. He goes into that mode, and the demon takes over him. Yeah. Now, I don't know if he's talking metaphorically or literally, but it is something that we absolutely watch. And when I say we, we there's a circle of um, people in the ministry, you know, people such as myself and actual bishops and priests. Mm -hmm. We even have a uh, Facebook group called The Exorcist Corner mm -hmm. where we share intel. And we actually watch the news. We pay attention. And there are absolutely um, cases that we have had where somebody has committed murder and it was they had legitimately blacked out and had no psychological activity prior to that or after. They're deemed psychologically solvent. Um, and yet they claim that they have absolutely blacked out. So, yes, we do think that people do get possessed and driven to do murder. Yeah. Um, and absolutely um, a serial killer. I met somebody who's not a career c criminal, but they're a, they're a functioning professional. And I'm convinced that they absolutely are um, possessed by a demon, that there is a demon in a meat suit walking around. And it's not just me talking because they're an ass. It's their behaviors and the things that they've done, the things that I have observed. Was it a horrible think. car dealer? <laughs> No, please. <laughs> With the shirt open and chains down there. Exactly, yes. Because <laughs> no, I, I, I've been convinced of that a few times. <laughs> that's, not a, that's not a bad analogy. But, yeah, I think that, um, I, you know, there's, you, there's obviously there's, there's true medical reasons people behave that way. There's sure. true psychological reasons, and you can't discount that. But if you go back to the very beginning of it all with Adam and Eve, you know, and, and it's, that story is really simple. Dad said, look, you want to live in my house, follow the rules. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do what you want. Get the hell out. Well, we got the hell out. 
Yeah. So they've been in the real world. Now we're susceptible to all these influences. So why yeah. is it that that the church has been hesitant to engage with exorcisms, especially in the nineties, uh, when you kind of started to to get into this? Is there a reason for it? They just don't want to have that view out there of of the, these things being there. Or what what is the the rationality? So you know, it, it started changing in roughly around two thousand and one and two thousand two, and and then the church started absolutely getting a lot more involved. Um, and that was in response to the popularity of ghost hunting and the, the high levels uh, taking place. Now, having said that, prior to that, um, and even still today, there's some hesitancy. There's a diocese not far from me. Well, Tulsa Diocese. Um, they used to be he- heavily involved. They had a monsignor and there's a St. Benedict Monastery um, not far from there That's that's been involved but the new bishop doesn't believe demon they, they believe in the he, he i'll describe it as a metaphoric demon okay he they're actually tangible um and that's my words so that's not his you know don't sue me um however there's a modernism that had been taking place and you hear vatican one vatican two vatican two was a drastic change in the way the church addresses the the real world and not just down to our um the way we um do our, complete our masses you know they they want to try to do away with the latin mass traditional latin mass but um also how we approach the modern world so there is a modernism of the church so there's an overall belief that you know if you hold on to these older traditions of you know you, you know the boogeyman spirits um then um it's going to push people away so that's the mantra that they took and it, and then there's legal connotations too. I mean, the Catholic Church is one of the most sued churches there is. So uh, there's been a lot of uh, suits associated with um, exorcisms. Now, I do want to clarify something. Yeah. Um, yes, I am absolutely Catholic. I am not associated with the local diocese here in Wichita. Sure. In fact, I am actually what's called Old Roman Catholic now. And the better way to, easier way to describe that is it's, it was a spinoff that happened in the 1870s um old roman catholicism where um and again i'll keep paraphrasing the church at that time decided to prop up the the pope as basically a deity and um you know there's a pretty good sect of bishops like no we're not doing this so it's spun off and we're actually a bit more progressive and we're independent but um we do uh, follow the catechisms and give a nod to rome um, and yes, the uh, Roman Catholic Diocese, a Roman Catholic Church, do reach out to me and interact with me, but um, they just don't admit it. <laughs> so. Interesting. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Just transparency might be a thing to uh, for them to kind of grasp onto. That that might make people a little more comfortable with with, wow. with what they yeah. like to do. It's like yeah, well, we learned the lesson, right? Yeah, it's like we uh, we anything in secret maybe maybe that's not going to work out so well in terms of attracting people um yeah yeah that's yeah when it it, it comes to things you know like that with with um when the church is uh reached out to is it difficult uh if someone today is having something that they suspect may be a possession maybe something demonic going on Today, a lot of times it's let's call the local ghost hunting team that we found on Facebook. Is that really the best idea to start digging into something that really could have very you know, deep lying effects uh, on, on one's life uh, over the next long period of time? Depends on what you're after. If you're um, curious and you're, you know, wanting to get evidence and things of that nature, um yeah a ghost hunting team will probably be more uh, attuned to that just know that when they do come the activity will get more active i mean it's going to get worse just, sure. it will maybe not right away it may take a couple of weeks but it will get worse because the, again they're given those permissions to come into your home for anything on the other side so that way the, so then i always you know tell people be careful who invite you invite into your home um you know get some references 
uh, make sure that they either can shut it down or ha- shut it down if needed or have access to somebody who can. Uh, then if you're really just wanting it gone and you're scared and, and bad things are happening and happening, call the diocese office. You don't call a priest. You don't call a church. You actually have to call the diocese office and be open and transparent. Say, hey, I have paranormal activity happening in my house. I would like for to talk to a priest about this. And they will absolutely put you in contact with the, the priest charged with taking those type of calls. Um, and that priest may actually hand off to somebody that they work with, somebody like me or who knows. But every diocese is to have an exorcist priest, even, even the one in Tulsa that I mentioned is supposed to have one. And give them a chance to, to take a look at it. Um, they're a lot more open and transparent. The, the local diocese in Wichita is actually very active in it. Mm-hmm. Um, the, this really, um, really heartwarming to see the priests come out. Um, you know, they call me anytime somebody calls me direct. The first thing I do is say, call the diocese and the diocese has, have, has been responsible responsive um the the priests have come out they've blessed the homes um multiple times trying to get rid of it if that doesn't work they, they've escalated to the the uh the local exorcist and um he, he's come out and, and perform exorcisms on behalf of the diocese i um typically go to places where either um, they're too scared to call the catholic church which a lot of people are terrified to, re- to call them uh, you know, it's the Catholic Church. It's the church's fault. It's not the people's fault. It's the church's fault. Sure. There's, uh, I've been contacted uh, by a lot of uh, priests who didn't want to interact with the bishop uh, for whatever political reasons. But uh, for the most part, when I'm dispatched, it's because they've, they, they're they not part of the Catholic Church. They don't really want to interact. What they do is they go to... Um, our website or they know somebody or you know there's by reference um i get involved but i i actually try to you know i mean come on it's a, it's a charity i go broke driving around talking to everybody and help them sure people. but uh, i do try to steer it to the uh, local diocese as much as possible when it comes to a location that has had traumatic horrible things happen in it uh, obviously, a lot of times people are like, ooh, it must be haunted. Sometimes there are uh, there's stories of activity happening uh, in locations like that. Um, and, and exorcism can be performed on a property. It doesn't always have to be on a, a person, correct? Correct. Now, that is correct. And, a, and a thing, and an object. Now, what, now when it is something that, that is like that, is, is there literally demonic forces just lingering hanging out in those settings is it some sort of energy that is there that's just it been, it's basically been implanted there because of of the actions of of what one horrible person did what are you exercising in in a location where there's something clearly you know dark going on there um uh, well first back to you have to figure out what it is that's there so there are multiple reasons and multiple things that could be there there's um uh, you call resident evil, right? You've heard that term. So there's a resident evil that yeah. can manifest due to all the negative activity going on by people within that location. Sure. This negative energy um, ends up building and manifesting in a, in its own identity that can absolutely um, kill people. I mean, it can tear people down and you'll have all the, the uh, paranormal activity or poltergeist activities. People like to call it now. Um, and, it, and it's, it's an energy that was created simply by people, human emotion, mm-hmm. you know, and there's not a real good way to actually take care of something like that. It's got to be, and it's kind of funny. Um, each case that I've come across this I had a house full of teenagers going through puberty. Um, and so the, 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 you know, you, um, let in as much uh, light as possible. You brighten the atmosphere, you keep the emotions down, counseling, 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 counseling. I can't stress that enough. Yeah. And, uh, professional counseling. Yeah. And, um, 
you know, if sage makes somebody feel better, um, sage can help, but or you don't have to use sage. There's other incense. So there's there's remedies of that nature that you can do to something that that is manifested like that. There are um, nested demons. Um, there's one in Newton, Kansas. And um, having been here, I don't know when you're here, but you may recall in Newton, Kansas, there's a young man who grabbed a shotgun and went and shot his father, who's a beloved teacher in a grocery store when he was working there during the summer. Um, well, that young man was living in this twin home that was built in the 1910 mm -hmm. and um, has actually had traumatic activity for decades. And the family who owned it is actually one of the sons um, was a Protestant priest. Another son was a Methodist priest. Another son was in seminary to become a Catholic priest. And the uh, diocese, um, local diocese, actually told them to get a hold of me, of all things. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that was an extremely active case. There is um, a, two suicides. Um, there is the murder I mentioned. And there was another murder where a toddler was unfortunately shot and killed with a shotgun. Um, there is, we stopped counting at roughly 11 abandonments that they had on record. People just leave their stuff there and leave. The South Newton police has on reports, um, um, not, to, not just in cases, investigations, and video of the doors, exterior doors opening on their own. Nobody home. Um, so it's a well documented um, wow. de demonic activity yeah. happening in this home. And uh, so they reached out to me um, because dad had died. It was a rental home. They bought it from Bethel College um, back in the 70s. They used to be a uh, um, kind of a dorm for um, faculty. And uh, they bought it, turned it into a rental, and all this activity started happening. And they got a hold of me. Uh, it's kind of funny. The first day I, we pulled up, um, I'm, I'm bringing a um, psychic with me and somebody to a video at all. And uh, we noticed the dormer. So I was already told nobody lives there. No, And the water shut off. The electricity shut off. Um, they didn't want anybody to live there mom is in there starting to the, you know she's about to enter hospice they wanted this house taken care of and before it moved on to somebody else's ownership yeah so she was meeting me out there right so i pull up and it's a it's a twin home so i pull up in one drive and she but she's in the other and when we pulled up we noticed the dormer windows one's dark one's light the light one is light because the mini blinds are shut okay so i you know me and a gentleman go over to talk to you uh, the, the little old lady help, help her out of the car. Yeah. And the young man that was with me came running up. He says, Hey, hey, I just saw somebody look out of that window. And I look up and I see the mini blinds like somebody had used two fingers to open them uh -huh. and shut. Oh, God. So I'm like, Okay. So, you know, there's there's somebody squatting here. Yeah. I got the keys from the lady. I opened up the front door, made a beeline to the back door, and it's dead bolted. It's still, it's still shut. It's dead bolted. There is. There is no basement. There's a cellar you enter from the outside. Yeah. But no basement. So I go running upstairs and I get hit with the fear. I, the, a fear I've never felt before. The fear, type of fear you, you taste metal. Uh huh. At that moment, at a desk, and I'm talking an old solid wood desk that's three feet by five feet by three feet high gets tossed across the room. And they say that I was actually in there for up to 15 minutes they didn't actually time it but they're certain i was in there for up to 15 minutes 30 seconds passed for me before i was back out that house so i don't know what happened there but yeah that 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 is a nested demon and unfortunately and the story goes on um but unfortunately um it's still there it that home was not cleansed is it still she, being rented out yes Wow, that, I'm, I'm, I don't think I, I mean, it, it, you having that experience there, is there anything that would ever bring you back into that place if somebody said, please investigate this further with us? Well, yeah, actually, so something that's strong, it's kind of fun. I left that, that, that day, that evening, you know, we interviewed her. Um, we, I left that evening ready to come back. I got a call from a psychic out on, uh, the west coast i had never met her I had no idea who she was uh, she said that she had a vision that uh and you heard me say mentioned nephilim 
that there is a Nephilim in this location. And the reason why she was calling me was because if I brought my daughter and she thought that it was convinced I was going to bring my daughter in there. If I brought my daughter in there, it was going to attack her. And she wanted to be warn me. Yeah. Um, so she knew about the house. She, I mean, of, of course she's sharing things with me that she knew about me that really blew my mind. But, uh, having said that we, I did go back with the team and we did get our evidence. Um, we did approach the local diocese. There's actually at the time an exorcist in Newton at one of the churches and they did not want to get involved. So I was scheduling the archbishop to come in from California when the um, mother passed and um, so the property went into probate and ended up being sold um, at auction so we never we never got back in there i would go back in um, but i would go back in with um, reinforcements obviously i mean is there locations that really just that they can't be cleansed there's just been like it, it the power that oh, is yeah. there is there's no human, no matter what their credentials, no matter what church they're coming from, no matter what experience they have, that there's just nothing that's going to be able to go against it. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. There are so there's we don't pick fights with demons. Uh, you, you just don't do it. You, you, you go into spiritual battle against a demon when you're steered to do so. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people. Um, especially ghost hunting groups, they'll like try to go seek out demonic activity at, you know, these nested areas. They'll search for them. And, you know, whether it's actual demon or ghost um, or human spirit, but they'll, they want that terror. They, they seem to you know, everybody gets kind of, kind of like mirror goggles, right? They're mm-hmm. puffed up. They've, they've interacted with a few spirits. They've got some cool EVPs and pictures and maybe even seen some things. And now they're puffed up and they're ready to go. Mm-hmm. And go into these areas, you know, there's a demon here. I'm going to show us who's boss. Well, they end up getting hurt. And then they call me and they want me to go take care of it. It's like, why? Leave it alone. Yeah. You don't go in there, pick a fight with some. You're talking about ancient beings. I mean, you're talking about my Latin was corrected by a demon. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you're, you're talking about a, an entity that can quote, every religious text backwards to you if they wanted in whatever language you wanted to hear it in. Yeah. They're, you're not going to challenge a, a, a name in, you, in that manner. You just leave it alone. It is the best way. You can't kill it. You can bind it. Bindings only last so long. You can cast it, of course, but the casting, you know, it can come back. And when it comes back, it comes back with a vengeance. It's pissed and it's going to come back and do damage. So you don't pick a fight. There are some locations that there's demons there. We know they're there. Um, you know, one ex- you know, exorcisms typically don't happen overnight. There's one location in upstate New York where the diocese worked on it for two years before they determined it was clean. Two years of it, once a week, every week, performing an exorcism. And even after they were done, they still went back every other week. Then every, you know, then every three weeks, then every month. And- yeah. So, yeah, to your point, there are places that are so demonic, you just leave them alone, burn it down, put a fence around it, you know? Yeah, there's there's just so much where, you, yeah, it's beyond. It, 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 can the same be said for people as well, that, that sometimes they are just too far gone in, yeah. in what they've, they've done, and that they're not necessarily sitting there, you know, spitting pea soup, but they they are just so far gone in their darkness that I mean, and, and this may be here's another example of I, I like throwing local examples your way because you know them. The Carr brothers, that would be I, I look at that case. And if people are not familiar with this horrible massacre where these these two men literally broke into uh, a home where some young folks, uh, young adults were having a party. They ended up forcing the couples to have sex with the incorrect partners, uh, ended up taking them out, long story short, to a field and executing all of them. One of them survived being shot in the head. Uh, But these people have never shown remorse whatsoever for their horrific acts, and the brutality goes far beyond what I just summarized there in an eggshell. 
Uh, look it up. Like Wichita Massacre, I think, is the uh, Wikipedia entry if you want to read more about it. But someone like that where you see them uh, it, just literally no soul. I mean, just literally no no remorse, nothing. They're missing something. Is that a possession? Is Or are there literally people with no souls or they've, they've somehow been taken from them at some point and now they're just shells and they walk around and do horrible shit? So the question is, I don't know. Uh, are they evil? Are, are people like that? Uh, well, let's answer, let's answer yeah. the, the first question. Yeah. Um, are, can, are they redeemable? They're only redeemable if they want to be redeemable. It's it's all uh, free will. Are they if, capable of wanting that, though? And some people, I wonder, are they even I, capable of it? Yeah, I, I, I think if they, like Carl Brothers' perfect analogy, I don't I don't think if they want it. I think if they absolutely are um walking human demons um you know did they do something to get a demon invited into them and take over um we'll never know sure but uh, i do think that there are people who are just simply so evil um that they just they're they won't be redeemed they they won't ask for redemption they don't want redemption yeah but then again there are those who have um you're local. You you remember the uh, murder and dismemberment in the bottom of a Hispanic club? I South- was just looking that up because I couldn't remember the name of the place. I've been there. I, so, yeah. I, yeah, it used to be called Rock Island, right? Yes, yes. I, I went there when I was looking to meet people because I just worked at the radio. Yeah. I, 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 I It was like 2006 or so, so it was only like two years after the um, the issue when they used to, the, the horrible dismemberment. I went with a ghost hunting group there and yeah. and we walked around and I remember walking into that basement of that nightclub uh, by yeah. myself and it, the lights were off. The only way to get to one of the lights, you had to like really walk into this dark room and find it. And I, I'm not a, a very sensitive person. At least I, I don't. At that time, I didn't think I was at all. I think I'm a little bit now, but there was such a we and I didn't even know exactly what happened or where it happened until I walked out of that basement. But then yeah. somebody told me, yeah, like all these people were shot and dismembered in this basement of this this nightclub. I think it was called like JC's House of Rock or something at that time. Um, yeah, it ended up being a lot of different things. Yeah, the it, it just kept well, changing names. Yeah, but it was it was a weird weird energy. Guess what? What that was a sanitarium built in 1928. Oh my and god. So- there's originally a poor farm on that corner. So, you know, there's a, the bowling alley that not too far from there. And for the listeners, this is on the uh, corner of Pawnee and Oliver in Wichita, Kansas. Yeah. So there in 1870, a poor farm was built by the Cedric County and it contained, uh, encompassed all, I think 470 acres. So it was big and Jester's Creek ran through it. And this, um, in 1928, the County ended up building that building that this nightclub was in as an infirmary and it was a house it had tuber- tuberculosis huts and went through the spanish flu and it ended up um and you know granted the, the the tuberculosis and spanish flu um peaks were not during this period but it absolutely did was built for those purposes and it ended up being shut down in the last patients moved out of it in 1948 where they were moved to the uh, new hospital on uh, west douglas and then it became so it had all these deaths associated with it like yeah, yeah. Dying, dies i mean back then you, it's just they make you comfortable as hospice basically yeah so you had all those deaths and the, the yeah the uh, paranormal activity actually was being spoken of i was i'm gonna date myself i was going there back in the late 80s where there was a band by the dead orchestra playing out there mm-hmm. um and uh, a gentleman that I knew threw a beer bottle into that basement. They came flying back out. I was there and I witnessed it. So <laughs> it's a weird. Have you ever gone into the basement? Uh, no. Um, once I found out, did the history. So yeah. um, I'm wanting to do a, a production and uh, of these stories and tales that um, you end up going outside to find something still there. Yeah, it's a very, it's a weird layout of a building too. It, it, doesn't, oh, yeah. it, it doesn't make a lot of, like you go in there like, what is this? And it's just weird. It's a weirdness vibe to that whole building. It's burnt down now. Oh, it's gone. Yeah, yeah. So I, in fact, you can even go on cake 
um, they interviewed me d- d- explaining what the building was and the history of it. So there's a little story spot on cake. And uh, oh. uh, yeah, it, uh, the some guy, in it, they, he bought it for like 40 grand in an auction about 15 years ago, could never make a go of it. It kept sitting vacant. And we think that somebody, it was a real cold night. We think somebody, you know, broke into it, and tried to light a fire to keep warm and set, set on fire. So tragic loss, tragic loss of history. Yeah. But, my, yeah. My goodness. Yeah. No, that I was literally, I was going to bring that up. So I was going to ask you if you knew anything about that case as well i just couldn't think of what i couldn't think of the rock island name i was searching yeah. wichita murder basement of nightclub <laughs> well that... here's the thing i read the court cases and i and spoke actually interviewed some of the family members and it's it's documented that it was there was in the dismemberment there's possible satanic um rituals taking place as either i mean the the murders itself and the dismemberment was the murders were because the guy was just nuts. Um, the, the dismemberment was just to dispose of the bodies. But the two people that two of the people that were involved, one of them was known to be a Satanist. Now, um, fast forward to 20, and I didn't know, I knew about the murders. I didn't know about this. Fast forward to 2014, I actually got a case handed to me to go help a mother who of an autistic son who's being attacked by a spiritual entity. Further investigation found out that this entity was actually a curse that was sent to attack her, misfired, hurting this child. And the person who sent the curse was one of the ones who dismembered the bodies in the bottom of that sanitarium. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Small world. (laughs) Yeah. Hey, I've seen you before. So, um, but you know, back to the redemption. Yeah, <laughs> back is you know one of those persons has absolutely uh, redeemed himself, and uh, as far as I'm concerned, um, you know, living a productive life, um, a good life, and has you know, it's probably stands a real chance of going to heaven. You know, it's not my judgment; I don't sure. make the call. But in my opinion. Um, I do think that he has done so. So you, you can be a bad person and do some really bad things. If you want to change and you want salvation and you seek it, it'll be there. But it goes back to the people who don't want the salvation. What's wrong with them? You know, that's just, that's, that's a million dollar question. If you can answer it, let me know. That wraps up our conversation with Timothy Earl. A big thank you to him for joining us and being a part of this extended interview today. Very fascinating conversation. And thank you for supporting the show and keeping us on the air. We would not exist without it. Until next time, for all of us at The Grave Talks, I'm Tony Bruschi. Thanks for listening.